Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight for a very special evening with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm honored to welcome you all to the David Geffen Theater at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, the largest institution in the United States devoted to the arts, sciences, and artists of movie making. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of the water and land on which we program, curate, educate, convene, and discuss. We honor and respect Tongva ancestors and the Tongva community today, which continue to nurture this land and water through traditional practice, activism, art, and education. We also acknowledge their continued work to safeguard cultural resources. And now let's dive in. My name is Doris Berger. I'm the Vice President of Curatorial Affairs here at the Academy Museum. The curatorial team that I lead at the museum strives to create inclusive and accessible exhibitions that further the understanding of cinema, produce thought-provoking uh, publications, and collect seminal objects of our shared cinema histories. One of these objects couldn't relate more to this evening and to our distinguished guest, as well as to our screening, um, because we have the animatronic puppet head from Arnold Schwarzenegger's character, The Terminator, T-800, which was created for the blockbuster film, as we all know, Terminator 2, in a Judgment Day in 1991 by Stan Winston's studio. It is on view in, in our Encounters Gallery on the third floor of Stories of Cinema. So if you haven't seen this yet, please go and come back and check it out. It's worth it. As a fellow Austrian-American, I'm so excited and pleased to celebrate Mr. Schwarzenegger's many accomplishments. We all can learn from his hard work, talent, and perseverance as bodybuilder, actor, politician, and climate activist. I wanted to add also a special thank you to Mr. Schwarzenegger directly, because he opened many doors for international film artists in American cinema, and in particular for actors with Austrian and German accents, like mine, to be offered a broader range of roles. In this respect, and I never thought I would say this, but in this respect, thank you, Mr. Schwarzenegger, for becoming an action hero. Let me briefly switch to German, our mother tongue. Herr Schwarzenegger, als österreich-amerikanische Kollegin freut es mich besonders, Sie heute am Academy Museum begrüßen zu dürfen und mit Ihnen und diesem enthusiastischen Publikum hier Ihre unermesslichen Erfolge im Kino zu feiern. Now back to English. <laughs> we'll close this program with a screening of Terminator 2 Judgment Day in 3D. And you all have your classes ready, I hope. Yeah, and uh, first we have a conversation. Um, so the screening fol will follow the conversation. I can't wait for you to experience this film with the state-of-the-art audio and visual capacities of this incredible theater. As a reminder, Arnold Schwarzenegger's book, um, new book called Arnold, is published by our friends at Taschen and is available for purchase through the Academy Museum store. A couple of reminders for our program here tonight, which is being live streamed. And hello to our folks who are watching from home, hopefully from comfortable sofas. Um, please uh, refrain from video and audio recording. And for the audience here, please silence all of your devices. And now, please let me introduce our guest speaker, Benedikt Taschen. Benedikt Taschen is the legendary founder and publisher of Taschen, a visual book giant that has released some of the most coveted publications in the world. Born in Cologne, Germany, he has resided in Los Angeles for over two decades. Likening their work to that of cultural archaeologists, Taschen transforms subjects, such larger than life subjects, into at hand works of art. In addition to Arnold, Benedict Taschen is responsible for publishing career-defining books with Renzo Piano, and that's the architect who built this wonderful building here, um, as well as Helmut Newton, Annie Leibovitz, um, David Hockney, and Naomi Campbell, just to name a few. 
audacious in its publishing choices, published to a shine in its production values and baroque in presentation, a Taschen book defies all expectations. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Benedict Taschen. Thank you very much, Doris. That is very kind of you. Good evening, everybody. I am Benedict Taschen, and I'm pleased to be here tonight. First, I want to say thank you to the museum, to the Academy Museum, to the director, Jacqueline Stewart, and to the curator, Austrian curator, Doris Berger for hosting this event tonight. Thank you to all staff members of the museum, Arnold Schwarzenegger's team and ours, too, for their dedicated work to make this evening go. Okay, let me start now. First time I have a written and typed up speech. Twelve years ago, I was introduced to Arnold by our common friend, the actor and bodybuilder, Ralph Müller, who can't be here tonight because he has to work abroad. The idea was born to produce a sumo-sized book about Arnold's life and work. What we knew so far was that Arnold came from a country which brought us, which brought to the world Mozart, Sissi, and Sigmund Freud. In the early 20th century, there was a melange of such a wealth of outstanding talent and diversity not seen since the Italian Renaissance 500 years ago. Architects, writers, painters like Kafka and Schnitzler, Klimt and Schiele, Baumeisters, means architects, like Schindler and, Lo and Neutra, uh, movie stars like Hedy Lamar and one of the most beautiful, great directors, Billy Wilder. They all came from Austria, Austria-Hungary at that time. Well, and shaped the landscape after the emigrate and culture of the country and the world from here on. And born there was, coming back to Austria, a baby, Arnold, in the aftermath of the war, caused by another Austrian. Young Arnold, well, <laughs> young Arnold visualized a different future behind the Austrian village. And far away on the other side of the world in Los Angeles, a city which attracts for many years and welcomes creative people. A variety is the spice of life like no other one on the planet. He took California by storm and after winning each and every bodybuilding contest there was, he got bored and thought to himself, there must be more in life for me. And against all odds, he became the biggest film star in the world. All on his own terms, among them, there was keeping his birth name 20 characters long. Among three of them, with three, uh, among three characters with an R, which made him, especially in parts of the world, very popular, like in Japan. <laughs> That's funny, I thought. Well, 
So he became even more popular than Godzilla they are. So, no accent elimination for Arnold. And on it went from there to new adventures under his life's mantra, the plan is there is no plan. Time went by and not too much happened with our project. We put one of our finest editors on the job. The marvelous Diane Hansen, whom I have the pleasure to work with for three decades. As a writer and an editor, she is responsible for countless books for Taschen. Among them, defining volumes which shaped the industry like the Big Book of Breasts, on Vanessa Del Rio, and Robert Crump, Frank Frazetta, and Tom of Finland, could have been an Austrian too, <laughs> but he wasn't. Uh, <laughs> we at Taschen see ourselves as cultural archaeologists, digging deep for photo and facts, for photos and facts often never seen before. Leaving no stone untouched to talk to eyewitnesses, writers and photographers, the task was follow as many traces to cook something Arnold and his fans would, be, would cherish to years to come. Up she came Diane, with the idea of the four pillars concept, athlete, actor, American, and activist. To structure the tremendous impact he had on many different areas of life and pop culture in general. Tonight he will share with Diane Hansen what makes him run. Please give a warm welcome to Diane Hansen and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Microphone. Are you ready, Very Arnold? Nice. Now you could hear the German sense of humor. World famous, world famous. <laughs> you know, when I met Arnold at the 1981 Mr. Olympia, I was just one more fan looking for a souvenir photo. And I was so inspired, I looked at him, his beautiful skin, his gorgeous body, and I ran home and joined a bodybuilding gym. And have kept it up for the last 40 years. Never, thank you, thank you. Never imagining he and I would be sitting on this beautiful stage. In 2013, we met again and began a series of interviews that shaped these books. And as he told me his witty, wise, and amazing stories, I realized we're going to need a bigger book. <laughs> so we came up with a second volume for the stories, the more personal photos. You're going to see about 70 of the hundreds of photos that fill these books on the screen as we talk. And if you want to see more photos, you can go buy the books. Tonight is about the stories. And we will start at the beginning. You were born July 30, 1947, in the British-occupied zone of Styria, Austria. The war had left the people broken, defeated, hungry. The winter had been brutal. The summer crops failed. And yet you, alone, surmounted all these obstacles. Can you tell us about post-war Austria and the vision that saved you? Well, yes. Uh, first of all, let me just say 
<laughs> very dramatic. The way <laughs> I'm in a theater. <laughs> wow. I mean, I don't even know how to answer that. To be equally as dramatic with the answer. But, um, but first I want to just say I always tell people that um, they're correct when they say <clears throat> that I'm, uh, you know, a typical American kind of a success story. And, uh, but they're wrong when they say I'm uh, self-made. And this is here a perfect example of that because this event wouldn't have come about without the great work of Benedict Tatarshan and his entire team and the people that run this uh, museum, this academy, without Diane and without all of you. If I would be self-made, I would be sitting here by myself. <laughs> <clears throat> Think about that. So I'm a product of millions of people helping me. I mean, you think about it, uh, how do you win governor? Five and a half m million people voted for me. Is this self-made? No, they made me the governor. I didn't create myself. So I always say to people is that I'm not self-made. You can call me anything you want, but I'm not self-made. I'm the, a product of a lot of help. And so I want to say thank you to everyone, all of you out here for coming here today and attending this. And I'm so happy that there was such unbelievable interest in Gord's gym when I was working out. Every morning, <laughs> people came up and said, can I come to your event, can I come to your event? So luckily, we did get the tickets, enough tickets for all of the people. So welcome to all the people that are here from Gord's gym and all the bodybuilders, <laughs> women and men. I see them all pumped up with the big calves and the vein veins. <laughs> But I always tell them, you don't have to oil up when you put a shirt on. So it's just, <laughs> forget all of that. But anyway, so this, this is it. And I, I, there's a lot of friends here. But there's one person that I see out there, for some reason or the other, I don't know why, maybe because it's right here. It's Mike Medavoy. And Mike, stand up here for a second. And uh, this is the man that was responsible for the first Terminator movie. <laughs> and... <clears throat> And also for Stay Hungry and so many other movies that I did after that. He was the, you know, the head of studios, many, many different studios, and I happened to work with the studios, so he always was in some way or the other in charge of my projects. But he's the one that came up to me at one of the screenings and told me that there's a great part for me in Terminator. And um, the rest is history. So, I mean, it was really fantastic. So we've, of course, stayed friends for many, many years. Now let's get back to your let's question. Get back. <laughs> the, the question. Yeah, Austria was. Um, I was born two years after the World War finished. Austria was in a disastrous situation. Uh, we were occupied by four countries: the uh, French, Americans, uh, the British, and the Russians. And our area where I lived, where I was born, was occupied by the British, and um, it was. You know, no food was around. I remember that my mother would go and would be gone a lot of times, and she would be going from village to village to beg for food at various different farmers, just so that she has enough food for the family. So, and the men were all depressed because they just lost the war, so they were all still licking their wounds. And you basically grow up with people that, the people that are losers. They've just lost the war. They were drinking. They were depressed because of it. Because of the alcohol and because of the drinking, they were kind of sometimes very brutal. Our upbringing was very brutal and very physical. We as kids were beaten many times, slapped around. Then other times not. Other times it was pleasant and nice. But it was a kind of an upbringing that was an interesting combination of brutality and the toughness, tough life, little food, no money, no one had anything. But at the same time, it was a beautiful place. I mean, the, the, the winters were very romantic and beautiful. The snow was coming down in November, December. We were sledding. 
We were ice skating and ice curling with, uh, with my father. The summers were beautiful, the Alps. It's a gorgeous place, Austria. So this was this kind of this interesting combination of beauty, but also of a place that I personally did not feel like I belonged there. I had the urge from early childhood on to get out of there. Of course, when you're a kid, you don't know how to do that, but then eventually you get old enough and you get with the program and then all of a sudden I came, became obsessed with America. America was the place that won the war. America was the place that was the fastest growing economy. America was the place that was beautiful. So I remember at the age of 10, we saw uh, videos um, in our classroom about America. And I saw the Golden Gate Bridge, I saw Hollywood, the beaches here in California, the New York uh, skyscrapers, the cars with the huge wings, the six lane freeways. I mean, it was just, everything was just so big and so beautiful that I really wanted to come to America and I felt like I'm much more interested being in America than being in Austria. And so that's what kind of launched my desire to do anything and everything that I could to get out of Austria. And how did you how did you hit upon bodybuilding as the root? I mean, we know that when boys are poor, they have only their bodies to work with. Was that part of it that you just looked at what you had? It became very clear that soccer that I was playing pretty much every day, because it's a big sport in Austria, but it's not an American sport. So I knew that soccer is not going to get me to America, <laughs> even if I become the greatest soccer player in Austria. If you can kick the ball across so, the ocean, So that was out of the question. <laughs> that was out of the question. So bodybuilding, when I saw friends of mine doing bodybuilding on a lake where I grew up, doing their chin-ups and they lifted weights there and there were shot putters there, wrestlers and boxers and power lifters and weight lifters and bodybuilders. Everyone was working out there at this lake. Um, I realized very quickly as I got into it that bodybuilding was an American sport. So I felt kind of like I could be another Steve Reeves that eventually did the Hercules movies and Reg Park, who also was Mr. Universe and did Hercules movies. So they became kind of my idols. And so I would read everything about those world champion in bodybuilding, and I would basically follow everything they did. So when I read that Reg Park was working out five hours a day, lifting heavy weights and doing you know, 50, 60 sets of exercise and lifting 50 tons of weights a day, I would do the same thing. And so, of course, my parents thought that I was a little bit sick uh, in my head, <laughs> and they felt I was overdoing it, and I was obsessed, and there was bad for my health. And there were those pictures of men on your bedroom wall. What did right, your mom exactly. say so, about so that? So I had, you're <laughs> absolutely right, I had the, like, um, you know, pictures on my bedroom wall of bodybuilding champions and of boxers and wrestlers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my mother was always looking at that wall. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, all of your friends have pictures of girls. <laughs> Where did I go wrong? <laughs> and she would cry. She would stand in front of that wall and cry every day. And though she called the doctor, our house doctor, mm -hmm. and she asked him, and he finally said, no, this is quite normal. You know, kids at this age, they idolize men that are strong and don't worry about it. He's not gay. And uh, so that was their, her biggest fear. And uh, so, but anyway, so we, I went through all of this, but they were my idols. And so I would train and train and train, and eventually I started winning competitions, and all of the stuff that I was told you would never make it became a reality. And I realized then that with the energy and with the belief, 100% belief in my goal, and seeing it, very clearly in front of me, visualizing it all the time, seeing that vision in front of me of being a Mr. Universe, being on that stage in London, 
at this palace where Reg Park won and Steve Reeves won and John Grimmick and all those guys won Mr. Universe, that I one day would stand up there on that stage. And it became a reality. So it was, we it taught me a lesson. in the book. Yes, yes, we have a book. Yeah. We have a picture in the book. When I, when I won the Mr. Universe with the age of 20. So I beat the record. I, I won Mr. Universe the first time when I was 20 years old. It became the youngest Mr. Universe ever. And from that point on, I started getting letters from Joe Weider, who was the publisher of the muscle magazines in America. He was kind of the king of bodybuilding and strength in America. And he started writing me letters saying, you should come to America. So I said to myself, this is really working. <laughs> and so then finally, when I won my yep. second Mr. Universe contest in 1968, Everything uh, with the age you of 21, I, I all of a sudden got this telegram. I'm going to send you an airline ticket. I want you to come to America. I want you to train with all the champions. You're going to train in Gold's Gym. I'm going to take care of everything. Don't worry about it. So it was like, you know, we started working on the visa and eventually came over to America and started training in America. So my dream of coming to America and being part of this great country became a reality. And it was kind of like really the greatest day in my life. I, I remember arriving in Los Angeles uh, at the airport and I literally kissed the ground Aww. of America. I mean, this is how much it meant to me. I was like... I was like so overwhelmed that finally I'm in America. So this is how the whole thing really began. And the, f the film Pumping Iron, however, really made a turning point in your life. There had never been a film like this about bodybuilding. Bodybuilding was still considered kind of this weird borderline thing at that point until people saw you on the screen and the power of your charisma at that point, everybody wanted to photograph you. Suddenly, muscles were beautiful. Well, uh, it was, it was an interesting thing because when I came to America, I thought that bodybuilding is very popular in America. It's an American sport, but in fact, it was not. <laughs> so it was kind of like what I read in the magazines, in the in Weeders magazines, mm -hmm. that bodybuilding is huge, and you know, this is you know, uh, kind of guys getting into movies with bodybuilding and become businessmen and become successful and making millions of dollars. That was, none of that was really true. There, there was some <laughs> of them that became successful yeah. and got into movies. But the reality was that when I walked around in America, people always came up to me and said, you must be a wrestler. You look really big. I said, no, I'm not a wrestler. They said, well, then you must be a football player. I said, no, I'm not a football player. Well, then you must be a lifter or something like that. So they did not guess bodybuilding. So I realized very quickly that I had to put my kind of like my know-how about selling and marketing that I learned when I was an apprentice in Austria. I said, I have to make, make this useful. And I started really hiring a publicist. It was the first, I think it was the first bodybuilder ever to hire a publicist. And we organized the Mr. International competition in Los Angeles here, Franco Colombo and myself. Right, um, and we hired this publicist, and the, the publicist, Shelly Sullivan was her name. And so she got me on the Tonight Show and the Murph Griffin Show, Mike Douglas Show, and all of those shows. And I was able to talk about what bodybuilding is all about. And I was able to talk to the LA Times, New York Times, Washington Post, and all of those papers I started talking and reaching out to explain what bodybuilding was so that people get educated. Because the press were writing stupid articles. <laughs> but not because they were vicious or they were negative, but they just didn't know. And bodybuilders were not inclined to communicate with the press. They always said, yeah, they always write shitty stories. I'm not going to talk to them. So I felt the opposite. I said, we should reach out to the press, and we should explain our sport, and we should show how beautiful it is and how great it is to feel strong and to feel healthy and to train every day and to compete in that or not to compete and just do it for fitness or to go and improve in another sport and get stronger. So that was kind of the idea. So bodybuilding kind of all of a sudden exploded in the 70s and pumping on, again, talking about not being a self-made man. Mm -hmm. Without pumping on, I would have not been able to be successful in this mission because pumping on really kind of showed the personalities of bodybuilders, the camaraderie, the kind of psychology behind it, 
you know, how you kind of pose off and can compete against and each other. And the beauty of it, because most people never went to a bodybuilding competition. Most people were not buying those Joe Weider magazines, but they went to the theater and they saw you right. guys and they suddenly realized they're not Greeks, they're Greek right. photo subjects. And you were photographed by all well, these guys. A lot of photographers, we have, we have really, in, in the, um, and I have to say, this is really an extraordinary work, this book. And I'm not saying it because it's called Arnold. <laughs> but I'm saying it because 10 years. You know, I've never ever done a project that has taken 10 years. I mean, even I won't miss the universe after five years of training. But this took 10 years from the time we started talking about it. So Tashin, they kind of carved out a niche for themselves um, and really took that business away from everyone else that used to make big coffee table books. But they worked, Diane and her whole team worked on getting the rights to all of those photographs. Think about what that is like. Yeah, I did every the one of those individually. I got every one of those rights. From, look at from this. I mean, look at this here. Robert this is, Maplethorpe. This is Andy Warhol. Yeah, this is Andy Warhol. Talk okay. about Andy Warhol well, I mean, photographing like, you. I mean, you know, all those people, you, you try to get the rights to those photographs, but that's easier when they're alive. <laughs> but a lot of this for Horrell, I mean, one of the most famous... Hollywood photographers that photographed every star. I remember just when he was very old, I, he still photographed me in 19, I think it was 1977. Um, so I was lucky to be photographed by him, uh, you know, or her Brits. Uh, you know, these people, they all passed away. Um, Richard Avedon, Richard, Richard Avedon. I mean, th think about it. These are people that photographed me for uh, Cosmopolitan magazine. All of a sudden, they get this invitation, this beautiful letter from Helen Curley Brown, who was mm -hmm. the editor of Cosmopolitan Magazine, right. and she said, I want you to pose in a nude, oh. in a centerfold. This was in the, the thing. book. They're in, in the, the book. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I knew that I the Burt Reynolds, <laughs> we talked about that, that yeah. Burt Reynolds uh -huh. was the first one to pose and do the centerfold for Cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge hit. It was a great idea by her, by the editor, right? Uh, so she then there was then uh, uh, you know football players she had there. Then all of a sudden she wrote to me. She said, "I want you." And here's the reason why I think this would be great. And it's not really total nude. You hide some things, but I mean the 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 bottom line was <laughs> the idea was that you're lying there or whatever you were doing nude, you know, and and, and to make it acceptable uh, for the newsstand. But in any case, so I did it. But this photographs that there's, there's really were classic photographs and great uh, one of the best photographers in the history. But the guy is dead. So now she had to go, and then you go to those estates mm -hmm. that own the rights, and they are fighting, the kids are fighting amongst each mm -hmm. other of who is really the rights, and they are in court and trying to battle it out. So it's like it was it took years and years and years to put this book together. It's like really producing a movie, so to speak. A lot, a lot of work, a mm -hmm. lot of money this went in there to get those rights from the photographers. It was easier from the bodybuilding photographers, but that was also a challenge. You know, they have like uh, Jimmy Caruso, a uh, bodybuilding photographer, Arizella. Uh, and, and Albert, Albert Busick. Albert Busick, Albert uh, Busick started your photographic career. Well, he was one of the first guys, first photographers that photographed me when I won the Junior Mr. Europe competition. And so from the time I was like 18 years on, he has photographed me. And he's still photographing me. He's still, when he comes to events, he's photographing me. So he is, mm -hmm. I think, the biggest collection of photographs of me. But he's a great photographer and, um, and really very, very talented, very well known in the bodybuilding world, not only for his photography, but also for his writing and his brilliant mind and all that. I mean, Albert Busick was one of the first people I interviewed for this book. And he told me that when he first saw you, and you were what? 16, 17 years old, he said he knew that he was looking at who would be the greatest bodybuilder of all time. And he could see it. He could see it not just in the shape of your body, you know, the proportions of your body, the bones and the muscle mass, but in your determination. 
and you said it yourself. You said other people went to the gym and they lifted and they worked out, but only I was relentless. And that... Well, that you know, was it's a bit of a saying in German, Venjan, Denjan, which basically means if you do something, do it go all the way. Mm -hmm. You know, don't go to the gym to talk. And there's so many times in the gym that just stand around and talk and gossip and somehow even come to the mm -hmm. gym and eat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I, I don't do any of that. I just go to the gym and I just go from machine to machine to machine to machine and I work out because the gym is there to work out. Then in the restaurant, I eat. And then, you know, in the bedroom, I sleep. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you do the play exactly the things <laughs> they're supposed to do in these various different places. But, I mean, you don't go to the gym to eat and then go to the restaurant and lift weights or something like this. I mean, I don't know. But so, anyway, so I was always very intense. But I always had fun. Mm -hmm. But I always was very intense. But this is with everything like this. Look, that's why one of the rules to success that I talk about in my uh, success book that's coming out being useful. It's coming out in October. Uh, it's 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 about that. It's it's. I'm talking about one of the rules is work your ass off. It's just there's nothing better than working your ass off. You can find shortcuts, you can find ways around it, but in the end, it takes a lot of work. No matter what you do, no matter what you want to be successful in, you get takes a lot a lot of work. So don't ever think that you can cut short the work. No, it takes work, work, work. It's like uh, uh you know. Who said that the uh, work like hell and advertise? Uh, you know, early to bed, early to rise, work like hell. And oh advertise. yeah, I never listened yeah, to Ted that. Turner. <laughs> this, was te this was testing you. But also, if you go to the gym, you can work your ass on. We all want a good ass today, don't we? You can see a little of that in here. Uh, and you know, when you bring up those, when you bring up those Cosmo photos, I'm not going to get into that conversation. When you bring up okay. those Cosmo otherwise, photos, otherwise I get blamed of saying again for something. I'll let you talk about asses. I had to go to New York to find the Cosmo mm. photos, and they were done by the photographer Francesco Scavullo. He was a very big fashion photographer at one time. He was dead. His accountant had inherited his estate. So the accountant took me to a storage unit bigger than any storage unit I've ever seen, like the size of a, of a house. And it's lined with file cabinets. And he said, they're in here somewhere. And we, I spent three days opening drawers, opening drawers, open, until we got way down to the very end. And amazing photos. Yep. Yeah, there were, uh, it was worth it on that one. But, <laughs> you know, I want to talk about the Terminator, though, because you got, after, after you conquered bodybuilding, just put it away, you added on acting and was determined to become the greatest action hero of all time. Terminator 2 is your highest grossing film. It's fan favorite. What is it that makes the Terminator as a character so compelling to people? Well, first, let me just say that the first Terminator movie um, was pretty much in the beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. I've just done, at this point, Conan number one and Conan two, and uh, then, was, uh, then was Terminator. Yeah. And... Why I mention it is because what was interesting about it is, is because I always heard my whole life, no, you can't do that. Oh, this is impossible. So that's why one of the other rules to success I always say is, don't listen to the naysayers. Because there's always people around that say, no, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So of course, when I started getting tired of bodybuilding competition and now won 13 world bodybuilding championships, so I said to myself, I'm not as excited anymore being on stage and beating all these guys. There must be something else that is kind of very risky, and I have to work hard, and something new that I could go after. And it was acting, and it was going into movies. And uh, so I, I remember that agents and managers, studio executives all were saying to me, says, forget it, Arnold. I mean, you're a great bodybuilding champion. We help you start a business or a gym or something like this. But forget about acting. No one has ever made it with a German accent. So if you want to be a star, yeah, we can get you parts in uh, some Nazi movie. Um, 
or we can, you know, get you a job as a bouncer in a movie or something like that. We can do things like that. Yeah, we can help you with that. But if you want to be a, a, a star, a leading man, impossible. And they say this is, number one, the accent. Number two, your body is too big. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, so I said, well, they did Hercules movies, <clears throat> and Steve Reeves and Rich Park and all those guys did movies. He said, well, oh, that was the 60s. Now we're in the 70s. Now the new sex symbols are Woody Allen. <laughs> <clears throat> they didn't ask the women. I say, <laughs> I say, what? <laughs> yeah, Dustin Hoffman, <laughs> Al Pacino. These are the stars that they, they weigh 125 pounds, those guys. <laughs> you weigh 250. I mean, you look like a monster compared to those guys. No one is going to hire you. So this is why I, it's important to know because Literally, a few years later, Ed Pressman comes to me and he says, I bought the rights for you for Conan the Barbarian. So think about that. And he says, because finally, when I saw Pumping Iron, I said to myself, that guy could do Conan. He has finally the body that no one has. He has the muscles. He can do Conan. So all of a sudden... The director said, if we wouldn't have had Schwarzenegger, we would have had to build him. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is how fanatic they were about the body. So now all of a sudden, a few years ago, I heard that it's impossible to get a job with a body like that. And now all of a sudden, this is the body we need for Conan. So I was absolutely in heaven. I said, well, here it becomes my asset. The liability, <laughs> what they said is the liability was my asset. So then comes Jim Cameron. I'm doing Terminator, Terminator 1. And he said to me, he says, you know what makes this movie so successful and why people really bought in is because you talk like a machine. <laughs> he says, your German accent worked to such an advantage. Mm -hmm. You talk like a machine, you talk like no one else does. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I said, wait a minute, now all of a sudden, this is an asset to have the German accent <laughs> to talk like me. It's an asset to have a body like me and all the schmucks in Hollywood were saying you would never get a job. You can never be a leading man. So this was the unbelievable turnaround. So this is why I mentioned that it started all in the beginning, uh, this really great kind of like explosion in my career, in my acting career. And then, of course, the move you're talking about, Terminator 2. The reason why I became a big hit was, number one, Jim Cameron. I mean, Jim Cameron is a genius writer. They always say what is, uh, what is not on the page is not on the stage. Mm -hmm. And so he's a great writer. He wrote the first one and did a fantastic job. And he came up with this brilliant idea, even though in the beginning I was suspicious. <laughs> he says, I want to make you a good Terminator. I said, what do you mean a good Terminator? <laughs> I say, I was killing 68 people in the first one. <laughs> I said, in the second one, I have to kill 150. We go up <laughs> with the count and the massacre can cut their throats and kill them and shoot them in the cannon and this and that, run them over with the car. I said, we got to do, I said, I got to out to Stallone. I said, remember, my whole mission is that, that I got to be number one in killing the amount of people in the screen. So he says, he says, Arnold, stop it. You're a very sick guy. <laughs> so, I, so he said to me, he says, I am going to make sure that in Terminator 2, you're not going to kill one single person. So I said, well, that, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I said, how can we do Terminator 2 without me killing nobody? I said, come on, at least a few token bodies we throw in there. I said, no, no. The whole idea is, he says, that the idea is that you come back as a machine, but this time you have to protect Linda Hamilton, and you have to protect this child of hers. Your mission is different. And we have another Terminator come back. This is the T-1000. Mm -hmm. You're the T-800 model, the somewhat outdated model. Mm -hmm. And it will be a T-1000, and that will be much more sophisticated than you are and that will be the battle between you and that character. He kills everybody, but you don't. You shoot people in the knees and in the, in the shoulders and stuff to disable them, but you don't kill anybody. And there's this great scene in the movie that you will see when you watch Terminator 2 afterwards, where I say to the kid, he says, I swear I will not kill anybody. And he made me swear to him 
not to kill anybody. And so there's this, uh, I, it's the brilliance of Jim Cameron. He's just such an extraordinary writer, and he's such an unbelievable director. You know, so this is, again, one of those things that I wish I could take credit for this movie. I can only take credit of the character that I played uh, and the way I played it. But, I mean, he has created this character. He has written it so well. He's written the movie so well. And that's why he's, you know, the number one director in the world with Avatar and all those kind of great movies, right? So, I mean, as simple as that. And speaking of James... I also, I also just, excuse me, that I cut you off. But, I mean, I just want to say that what was so amazing about it, just to show you the brilliance of writing, that at that time, we scratched the surface of AI, artificial intelligence. Think about that. We're talking here about in the early 80s. And today, everyone is frightened of it, of where this is going to go. And in this movie, in Terminator, we talk about the machines become self-aware and they take over. And so that is such a brilliant writing and, and, and because now after all those decades, it has become a reality. Yes. So it's not any more fantasy or kind of futuristic, it is here today. And so this is the extraordinary writing of Jim Cameron. And we see reference to it all the time. I hear them saying AI is going to get out of control and they always reference Skynet. Remember Skynet. But speaking of James Cameron, what's this about a trip up the Amazon River? Um, so, <laughs> Jim Cameron, as you know, he's not only a great director, but he also has become a great friend of mine. And, uh, you know, he's just a brilliant guy in so many different areas. And one of the things... Uh, that you're talking about is he was in, in always into the environment and to fight pollution and to take care of this world and not to have all these people die because of pollution and all this. And so he was really heavily into the environment. And one day, I remember we ended up doing a speech together about the environment in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And they had this huge conference, international conference, and so he was doing a speech and I was doing a speech. And then I, he took me to the Amazon. And to, to, we landed there with, with the plane, with the seaplane. And he said to me, he said, uh, as we were approaching this tribe, the Amazon, that he knew, he says, Arnold, I just want you to know not to get your ego bruised. Because there, no one is going to know who you are. Mm -hmm. That I can promise you. And I said, well, thank you for warning me. I said, but trust me, it's not going to bruise my ego. Don't worry about it. So we land there. We get out of the plane. And within a minute, people were chanting, Arnold, 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 Arnold. And then they took me to a hat where they had actually a poster of mine inside that hat. As I was looking at this poster, this huge snake dropped down from the tree that almost killed us. I mean, a monster snake just dropped down and wild boar was running around and there was all these animals there. It was just crazy. But I mean, Jim Cameron was like freaking out. He says, well, I guess I was wrong for the first time in my life, you know. Yeah, yeah. Jim has a big ego. But in any case, but, uh, but in any case, so that was really funny. So I think that's what you're uh, talking yeah, about. That's what because I'm no one that's expected what I'm them to know anything and it, you know it was not like i should get the credit at all because jim deserves some of the credit too because mm -hmm. it was some of his movies that they saw and i was in those movies but no one expected them because there was no television set there so we don't know really how they get the information and how they got to see those movies or anything like that so and there you go. i was very happy to be that recognized all over the world well you have said that muscle is the universal language that you are known all over the world. It, you are better known than the US president, even before you became governor. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, I, look, the old jokes aside, it's when you have been around for that long. You know, I'm this year, 
Next month, I'm going to be 76 years old. And uh, thank you. And uh, so think about it, all of the bodybuilding competition worldwide, going from continent to continent and competing. So you gain a tremendous amount, millions of people that follow you in bodybuilding. So then you get into acting. And then you have all these action fans, millions and millions of people around the world, action fans. So they're, they're becoming your followers, and they go and see movies and all this stuff. Then you get into comedy. And then there's a whole other group of people that love your comedies. They go and see that. Then you start getting into politics. And now they start following your political career and public service, being a public servant, and then getting involved in environmental issues, and then getting involved in, 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 in kind of government uh, you know, reforms. and So, so th this is stuff that is worldwide. So of course then you become really well known by just from the athletes on yeah. to the, the baby boomers to the newer generation and all of that stuff. And you know, and still I'm doing my, my work. I mean, I've just had the, the TV series you know, with the Netflix, Fuba, and um, thank you. <laughs> and then the documentary Arnold, you know, that that, that, that came out, uh, which was also a huge, huge hit. So you know, all of this gets to be, you know, the people get to know you, and I'm very happy that my movies play anywhere in the world. And I think it's basically also because I feel like I'm a citizen of the world even though I'm most aligned with America. But to me, I think that there's wonderful people all over the world. And I got to know through traveling around the world, I got to know so many people that I can say today, I love when I go to Africa, I meet wonderful people. When I go to the Middle East, I meet wonderful people. When I go to uh, European countries all over the place, Australia, Asian countries and all this. So there's great, great people. So this is why I always find it so odd when countries are fighting and arguing or when even within our own country, people are fighting and accusing each other of being stupid and being left wing or right wing or this wing or that wing. It is ridiculous. We got to get along. We got to be together. So this is what I talk about always. So, you know, I think that because of that, you will see posters in, uh, well, you saw that, actually. You want to tell that story? Well, are you talking about the praise portraits? Well, when yeah. the posters in the terrorist camps. Yeah, and, uh, yes, exactly. When I was looking for photos for the book, I found pictures of Arnold posted up, people in, in just rubble with a poster of Arnold on the wall, and they were working out. They were working out with whatever they had. They have posters in Palestine. They have posters in Israel. They have posters in every part of the world across all lines. I mean, you were a Republican governor, but you were elected by people on both sides because, as we say, muscle kind of crosses the line. and. You have made three powerful videos in the past two and a half years and posted them directly to social media. Why do you go directly to social media for this? Well, I think that you have the luxury today to do that because you have direct access to the people. I don't have to hold a press conference. Like in the old days, you would have to hold a press conference and then the press ask you a bunch of questions that, uh, you know, kind of, uh, and then the stories go off in different directions, and it's not as targeted. It's more than a shotgun approach rather than a rifle approach. And I think that my message is, is meant to be like a rifle approach. You hit the target, you know exactly who do you want to talk to and what you want to accomplish, and so that's the advantage of it. doesn't mean that we don't need the press. I am a product of the press, and so I always include the press, and I always would talk to them, and I always would be available for interviews and press conferences and all this, but it's just an additional luxury that we have to do those videos and to look straight in the camera and to communicate with the people directly. It doesn't matter if it's an insurrection a video, if it is about prejudice and talking about inclusion, um, if it is my trip to Auschwitz and to the concentration camp and to talk about that uh, issue 
uh, or to talk about the Russian war in the Ukraine. Uh, so I think there's a very important issues and it gives me a way with my platform, uh, you know, that in the, in the, we end up having like literally the last video had like five billion impressions. Think about that, five billion impressions. I could be doing interviews from here to eternity with the press and I would never get this kind of impressions <laughs> and we'd be the, with one video like that. So that's the advantage of that technology has advanced. It has its downsides, but it has also its upsides. Yeah, I understand that you were one of just 22 people followed by Putin on Twitter. <laughs> that means he has good taste. <laughs> <laughs> he probably saw the photo of you on the horse. Oh, that's in the book. That's in the book. <laughs> it's like, who did it better? Putin with his shirt off on the horse or Arnold with his shirt off on the horse? Well, I think any Libowitz would have that answer much better. But she took the photographs. <laughs> yeah, she yeah, did some exactly, beautiful yeah. photographs of you. And I see we are counting down here. We're almost done. Um, we have... One final question is on everyone's mind. The most important question, what is the proper technique for housebreaking a donkey? I didn't know you were going to get that serious. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, first of all, all of my animals that we have at home, none of them ever poo or pee in the house. Amazing. So this, it's really amazing because most people think, oh, my, you have to clean up the stuff all the time. But you don't. I have my, I have whiskey, uh, my miniature pony, walking in and out of the house and walking around the house. Mm -hmm. I have a Lulu, my miniature a donkey. Mm -hmm. I have uh, now a little pig. <laughs> His name is Schnelli. <laughs> because Schnelli mean, Schnell means fast in German. <laughs> And so Schnelli runs really fast uh, around the house and to, to escape from the other animals. And, uh, you know, so we have, and then we have three dogs. So we have all of these animals. There's never an accident in a house. And then, like I said, they, they really roam around the house and walk around. They're in and out. I mean, they, uh, it's, we have just uh, had a wonderful time with those animals. And I tell you one thing that my grandchildren, See, Catherine, my oldest daughter, has two girls. Mm -hmm. And she comes over with those two girls and uh, like once a week and, and, and just plays around with the animals, with all of them. And the day, those kids have such a fun time. I never thought that this is going to be kind of the, the additional kind of joy when I have, <laughs> because I just love animals, because I grew up on a farm in Austria and I always enjoyed animals. And so that's why I have those animals. But I mean, my grandkids really loved it. And it gives me another way of kind of like really having them come to the house regularly mm -hmm. and having them enjoy themselves and then feed them and learning about it. And uh, also learning that they have to go to the stable and now we have to clean the stable. It's not all just fun. <laughs> so you have to kind of teach those kids right away. <laughs> when they're very little and young, I say, okay, you have to also do, do that. That's yeah. part of raising those animals. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a really fantastic. So the animals have been a real blessing to us. I love coming to your house because as soon as the car door opens, your dogs are getting in the car. You know, your animals, you do not have guard dogs. I shouldn't tell anybody this. He has giant dogs, but they are all friendly. They are all loving. What to you? All your animals you. get along. You bring, you bring them a lot of treats. <laughs> so that's why they, they, they love you. Exactly. Well, I get that from feeding the raccoons on my deck. Also, I just want you to know, whenever I say we at the house have the animals, I'm talking about me and my girlfriend, Heather, who is sitting right here in the front row. Aww. Heather, stand up for a second. Is Heather. Look at this beautiful girl here. And I'm proud of her. She's fantastic. She takes care of the animals. <laughs> no, we both, we both do. We both do. But anyway, I know you, you, you have 30... Oh, I just see this teleprompter here. It says 27 seconds. So you have 27 seconds left. And then we have to split. Uh, then we, so uh, what well, question no, do you have? At the end of this, then I have to 
tell everybody to give you a big hand. We got Arnold Schwarzenegger here on stage. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank we you. Love him. Four, three, two, one. It's over. <laughs> But I'm supposed to say something else, too. So don't anybody jump up. Come on, get up. OK. What's the matter with you? OK. I'm supposed to say, everybody, this concludes our interview segment. But I hope you are all going to come back after our 10-minute, uh, yes, break. I was. Intermission, our, yes, I'm very good at that. Our 10 minute intermission, go do all those things you need to do during an intermission. And then we'll be back with Terminator 2. And I can't reach it. Who's going to do it? In 3D. Very nice. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Okay, we'll see you later on at the screening of Terminator 2 3D.